Welcome everyone uh, to the uh, June version of TPA's T5 third Thursday at two training series. Of course, it's three o'clock today. We changed our time a little bit to accommodate our guest speaker uh, and we're glad you joined us. We're gonna be covering today some of the major energy and electricity policy related issues that transpired during this legislative session. And uh, we have a special guest with us today that I'll introduce in just a moment. But before we do that, a little bit about uh, our organization and a quick review on PACE. The Texas PACE Authority is a nonprofit. We work for cities and counties around the state to operate their property assessed clean energy financing programs. We work with property owners, uh, capital providers that provide the financing for these projects and the service providers that execute the projects. Uh, I serve as the chief operating officer of the Texas PACE Authority, Dub Taylor. And again, pleased to be with you today and glad you joined us. So quickly, what is PACE? Property Assessed Clean Energy Financing. It's a way of providing long-term financing for projects that have long-term benefits. Uh, in Texas, the things that qualify are energy efficiency, water conservation, distributed energy, energy projects in the commercial, multifamily, and industrial sector. The key to all this is, this is that the PACE loans are secured by a special property assessment uh, that runs with the loan that provides a, uh, a secure means of financing over a term much longer than typical equipment financing. PACE is authorized under state law. Local governments then uh, create local PACE programs, and it's a voluntary and open market program, meaning that if you're a contractor, a capital provider, or an owner, no matter where, uh, you can possibly uh, utilize PACE if there's a program there. And in Texas, the PACE market is growing considerably. Uh, we started with one county, and today we have 59 cities and counties around the state that offer PACE, covering about 60% of the population. Uh, if you look closely at the map and you do the math really quick, what you'll see is there are 58 uh, markers on the map, and 59 is our number. The newest, Erath County, just southwest of Fort Worth, uh, created its PACE program on Monday of this week, so they're not yet on the map. Uh, but it, but the, the map is certainly filling, and uh, PACE is available almost anywhere you, you would need it. And the reason that communities are setting up PACE programs is it's a win-win-win, win-win, that is property owners benefit through lower energy bills, operating costs, and added value to their properties. It's a new way of uh, helping finance projects that contractors are proposing uh, for owners. Uh, for lenders, again, being assessment secured, uh, this is a, a uh, longer term way of, of providing that financing for their customers. The state benefits through reduced uh, peak energy demand, both in the summer as we've always uh, known it to be and also in the winter as we now know uh, that we have challenges there. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later. The state benefits in, in a number of ways, including air quality improvements, through reduced power plant emissions, water conservation. And then for communities, this is a way to get uh, properties back on the tax rolls, reinvest in those, uh, in those Main Street projects uh, in the community itself. So for today's webinar, uh, as with most Zoom webinars, uh, everyone will be muted and video disabled. Uh, and if you have questions and answer or questions, we encourage those, uh, use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, not the chat box, but the Q&A box. And we will get to those questions uh, at least by the end of the webinar. We are recording this and it'll be available later on TPA's website. If you attend today, you'll earn an hour of professional development hours uh, that you could use for professional certification, CLE, et cetera, uh, uh, whatever the, the case may be. Probably not CL, this is not an official CLE, but engineering practices, et cetera. And uh, in the next hour, uh, you will be learning if you don't live in the world of utility uh, regulatory lingo uh, and policy, uh, some of the uh, acronyms you'll hear today and learn about, uh, ERCOT, OPUC, PUC, REP, and NOE. Uh, and in addition to those, uh, you'll hear some terms that maybe aren't as familiar to you, such as ancillary services, securitization, thermal plants, black start, and much more. So uh, with that, I'll introduce our guest presenter today. And uh, his bio, his brief bio uh, was in the invitation for this webinar and it's here in front of you, I won't read it. But uh, just to summarize, uh, I'll tell you, I've worked in and around the Capitol on energy issues for around 30 years. And uh, 
uh, there's, there's not a person I know that has uh, more expertise on uh, clean energy issues, uh, regulatory issues, uh, legislative strategy, and policy than Michael Jewell. And we're so pleased that he was able to join us this afternoon. Uh, this morning, uh, Michael did a very similar update for the Gulf Coast Power Association. And so I asked if he could do a, an encore uh, of, that, uh, of that presentation for us, for our PACE audience this afternoon, and he agreed. Uh, so with that, Michael, let me let me turn it over to you. And again, appreciate you being here. Deb, thank you very much. And, and I very much appreciate uh, very kind words. I will do all that I can to try to pepper this with as many acronyms as possible um, to to make it as confusing as possible. But um, OK, seriously, I'll try to try to minimize that. But um, anyway, don't hesitate to. Uh, uh, ask questions and definitely look forward to that. And if I can figure out how to, there we go, get this squared away. Um, anyway, so thank you very much. Uh, so today, I want to talk about uh, you know what happened uh, during the uh, just recently ended legislative uh, session, and um, let's see if it's still behave. Yes, it's behaving. So I want to start off with just a little bit of background uh, for everybody, just uh, who's not as close to the legislative process. Uh, the Texas legislature meets 140 days out of every odd numbered year. Michael, a lot I, of... I don't, I don't see your screen if you're sharing. Oh darn it! Okay, hang on. There we go. Yep. What are you doing there? We got it. Uh, we awesome. got it. Yep. Okay, so the legislature meets 140 days every odd numbered year. A lot of people have suggested that instead we should be meet, uh, that the legislature should meet two days out of every 140 years. But at this point, we're still staying with the, uh, with the status quo. There's 181 legislators, 150 in the House of Representatives, 30 in the Senate. Um, in 2020, the latest uh, round of the election, the um, uh, there had been a question with regard to whether the House would change from majority Republican to majority Democrat. It uh, actually stayed exactly where it was uh, with 8367 split and the Senate um, had a shift of one member to uh, 18 Republican, 13 Democrats. We're not like Washington in that people are not bound to, uh, to vote by their party lines in the same way that they are uh, seem to be up in Congress. Uh, which is a good thing, but these numbers uh, matter. And then also uh, as a result of uh, issues that occurred towards the end of last session, uh, we ended up with a new speaker, Dave Phelan out of Beaumont, um, which every time you get a new speaker in the house, there's always a lot of change that happens. And uh, that happened here as well, including a new chairman of state affairs, which is our jurisdictional uh, committee for, for, English, or for legislative issues. Let me see if I can to shrink this down a little bit more. There we go. Um, so back uh, at the beginning of the session, remember when? Uh, many moons ago, and it does feel like a really long time ago, COVID-19 was raging through the state and then the nation. Uh, there was a big question with regard to how the legislature was going to operate. They um, started off by uh, convening and then uh, recessing for long periods of time for weeks uh, at a time, um, you know, to, to keep uh, legislators from being all in the same place at the same time. There also were no visitors to the Capitol. Um, it was legislators and staff only. And so it looked like it was going to be a pretty odd session, um, uh, at least at the outset. Uh, the one bill that has to pass every time is the budget. Um, the you know, concern going into the session was just how much damage had been done to the Texas economy as a result of uh, COVID-19. So there was a real question with regard to how, bad, how difficult it was gonna be to get a budget. For those who work on capital intensive uh, development, there was a big question mark with regard to tax code chapter 313, which allows for the abatement of uh, school property taxes for capital intensive um, uh, developments like you know, you know, oil and gas uh, refining, uh, wind power projects, solar power projects, uh, by the, the provisions of the law, that bill or that chapter automatically expires December 31st 
of next year unless it was extended. And so that was uh, kind of viewed as a must pass bill. And then um, before each legislative session, the Public Utility Commission generally has a, has, uh, a number of legislative recommendations that, you know, for things that the uh, legislature should address and give the commission some guidance on. And this time it was very sparse. They had two. One was uh, charges for certain filings and clarifying what they could do there. And then also clarify an EV charging issue. And I will talk about that in just a little bit. So that's how we started the session. But then we had ice, we had snow. And, um, you know, winter storm Uri was an absolute bear uh, that everybody in, in Texas um, uh, suffered through and with a lot of different different issues. I'm not going to go there. But as a result of winter storm Uri, ERCOT and electricity became the issue of the session. Um, normally, the first few days of committee hearings are kind of organizational, getting some information from uh, relevant state agencies. Instead, the Senate Business and Commerce Committee had three days of hearings with regard to Winter Storm Uri. House State Affairs started off uh, joint hearings with the Energy Resources Committee for two days of hearing uh, on their own. Both hearings, all these hearings on the 25th and the 26th were going on simultaneously. Witnesses were running from one part of the Capitol to the other to be able to appear before committees. And there was a lot of texting going on back and forth between people in both committees to share what was happening so that that could then be used in um, questioning of, uh, of witnesses. It, it was quite a fiasco. In addition, uh, all of the ERCOT independent board members uh, resigned and as we went through the session, uh, we lost three, the three PUC commissioners as well. Finally, there were hundreds of bills on the electric industry uh, in the ERCOT region that got filed. Normally there'll be, you know, a handful of bills. No, it was in the hundreds this time. So this is kind of just a, a quick outline with regard to the issues that I'll touch base on. And I will, uh, like I said, try to keep it relatively high, but proud that in the first line, I've got three acronyms of ERCOT, P-U-C-T, and uh, well, ERCOT twice, okay. So first, uh, first group of bills I wanted to talk about is changes to the ERCOT market design, the commission and, uh, and ERCOT. And the first bill is Senate Bill 2, um, which addresses the governance of these entities. Um, top line on this is that the legislature said that um, all PUC commissioners, the counselor at the Office of Public Utility Council and the members of the ERCOT Board of Directors will all be Texas residents um, because there seemed to be a sentiment that if somebody is not from Texas or living in Texas, they're not concerned about the quality of our um, uh, electricity grid. I would disagree with that, but that was a decision that got made. There was also um, uh, the current board of uh, directors for the ERCOT board was eliminated and instead there will be a new um, board of 11 members. The PUC chair, the ERCOT CEO will be non-voting members. Office of Public Utility Council will be a voting member and then there will be eight additional members um, that are not allowed to have any fiduciary duty or assets in the ERCOT market. The goal is to ensure that they are uninterested, um, at least you know, directly uh, uninterested in, in the ERCOT market. <clears throat> the members, these eight members will be um, appointed by a, uh, selected by a committee of three, and that committee will be appointed by the governor, lieutenant governor, and the speaker. Um, in addition to selecting the members of the ERCOT board, the committee will designate the chair and the vice chair and the committee will work with an independent search firm um, along the lines of how the uh, ERCOT board currently works to find new members. A new thing that came out of this bill was also a uh, much more direct oversight of the commission um, over ERCOT with regard to having to provide a market impact statement for new and revised protocols and actually approving uh, the protocols. Senate Bill 2154 is a bill about the PUC governance. And um, what this does is it would take, uh, take ERCOT from three members to five members. Again, everybody has to be a resident of Texas. And then Senate Bill 3 
uh, is a, a very hefty bill with regard to uh, changing the ERCOT market design and, and addressing a number of different issues. Um, on the communication side, there's a bill to, or there's provisions with regard to setting up uh, a power alert, uh, power outage alert system. There is a committee designed uh, that is set up to uh, look at the um, coordination of a number of different industries, uh, industry members and agencies uh, to foster planning and develop a report to the legislature regarding the reliability and stability of the supply chain in ERCOT. The uh, Railroad Commission will identify critical natural gas facilities and entities. There will be a uh, committee that is formed to map the Texas ele electricity supply chain um, and identify the critical infrastructure and best practices to maintain service in extreme weather. The um, one of the issues that came out of the storm was a very high uh, renewed interest in the weatherization of facilities um, in the following the uh, winter outages in 2011, there was uh, recommendations that there be increased weatherization for um, uh, electric facilities. This time, because of how the storm marched through the state and what happened as it went through, uh, weatherization of natural gas facilities was highlighted, as well as electric generators and the uh, transmission service providers. The uh, Public Utility Commission and the Railroad Commission will adopt rules with regard to what the weatherization requirements are, and um, and the both commission both of those commissions will provide a biannual weatherization report to the legislature. Uh, the legislature also made sure that people understood that the legislature meant it when they said that weatherization was important. And uh, while $25,000 per day per violation was the maximum violation in ERCOT uh, for what for in the under the Public Utility Commission's enabling statute, that was increased to a million dollars per day per violation when it comes to compliance with weatherization penalties. So the, the legislature made it very clear that they meant that this is a very top priority. The other thing, uh, another thing that was done is that the PUC has a expanded um, uh, review and reporting uh, obligation with regard to emergency operation plans. Those normally have been focused on generators that was expanded to include electric utilities, municipal electric utilities, cooperatives and retail electric providers. Um, and the commission will be um, uh, collecting these emergency operation plans and reporting to uh, the governor, lieutenant governor, uh, and speaker with regard to um, the readiness in, for uh, severe weather uh, on an annual basis. Information with regard to load shedding also was a key. Um, you know, there was a lot of confusion with regard to uh, rotating outages and or the lack of rotating outages. And so one of the things that is going to be done is more information will be provided to customers to, to be sure that they understand what load shedding procedures look like um, and, and how uh, customers can apply to be critical care to, <clears throat> to reduce the likelihood of being um, subject to load shedding. One of the issues that was uh, hotly debated during the, this, um, in this bill was a provision that required um, intermittent resources, namely wind and solar uh, generation to procure ancillary services and replacement power to manage net load variability. Um, the problem with uh, the provision was nobody really knew what it meant. That the proponents didn't know what it meant. The opponents didn't know what it meant. Everybody knew that it was intended to be punitive. Um, and that was the clear objective of it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in the end, the sec that, that section was modified to require the PUC to review uh, current ancillary services to determine if they meet the needs of the ERCOT market, evaluate whether additional ancillary services are needed for reliability, uh, to require ERCOT to modify the design procurement and cost allocation of ancillary services. Normally, uh, the cost of an ancillary services is uh, because those services are procured to maintain the overall reliability of the grid, 
those costs are uplifted to all uh, customers. Uh, this looks at uh, whether there should be a modification in that cost recovery, moving it from the end use customers uh, to the generation side, although there actually may be a split that comes out of this, but it can be a very contentious issue as they look at this whole question about cost causation and uh, cost allocation. The uh, Another key provision that came out of this bill is a requirement for uh, there to be a focus on ensuring um, dispatchable generation to meet the reliability needs of the uh, of the commission of the region, uh, the legislature did not define uh, dispatchable di di generation directly. Try to say that three times fast, uh, but instead uh, defined what is not dispatchable generation, and that is if the facility's output is controlled primarily by forces outside human control. In other words, wind and solar. So the um, <clears throat> Wind and solar uh, generation need not apply to provide this reliability service. And uh, what the what the commission will do is work with ERCOT to establish the requirements for um, dispatchable generation to meet the reliability needs, how, uh, determine the amount of ancillary services and reliability services to ensure appropriate reliability during extreme heat, cold, and times of low wind and solar production. To procure the services, determine the appropriate qualification and performance requirements, and sizes the services to prevent prolonged rotating outages um, due to net load variability and high demand and load supply scenarios. And then also um, uh, resources that provide the services must be dispatchable and able to meet continuous operating requirements for the summer and winter season. So that's a mouthful of what does it mean? It really means that there's a wide latitude that the legislature has given ERCOT or given the commission with regard to potential changes to the ERCOT market structure. Uh, there was a discussion during the legislative session, Berkshire Hathaway uh, proposed to build 10 gas fired power plants at a cost of $8 billion. If the state would guarantee cost recovery for 40 years from all customers in the ERCOT region um, with a, uh, um, uh, a um, profit of about 9% um, on that investment. Uh, that proposed legislation did not pass, but the idea of it actually fits within the scope of this section to where the commission um, could make a determination to implement the Berkshire Hathaway uh, proposal uh, without further legislative authorization. There is also the potential to change the ERCOT market from a energy only market to one that has a capacity market where load uh, customers pay um, every month for uh, resources to be on the grid. Um, other markets have found there to be a lot of problems with, with capacity markets, but that is gonna be an issue that is, is up for debate. On the uh, wholesale pricing uh, side, one of the issues that has come out of Winter Storm Uri was the impact of having the wholesale price at the cap for multiple days on end. Um, <clears throat> and the impact that that could have on directly on retail customers. What, uh, what Senate Bill uh, 3 does is it requires the commission to adopt an emergency pricing program that will take effect when we've had those high prices at the market cap for more than 12 hours in a 24 hour period. Um, this is something that the commission will have to figure out. Um, it uh, allows, the commission is allowed to put a cap on energy, could be the same as the high price cap, could be lower uh, at price cap with regard to ancillary services. And, um, so anyway, we'll we'll see how all of that gels, but but clearly the, the legislature wanted the commission to take a look at that. Some of the other uh, issues that, that got addressed um, on a higher level, there's a landfill gas uh, provision that was set up for an, um, a particular customer in the Austin area uh, to be able to, to use landfill gas for electric generation. Uh, electric utilities in ERCOT will be allowed to design and operate new load management programs for commercial customers. Um, the commission is going to relook at load shedding by uh, utilities and how that gets done. 
Uh, there will also be a state energy plan advisory committee uh, that is set up to look at issues related to ERCOT, including barriers to markets that pre uh, prevent sound economic decisions, methods to improve reliability, stability, and affordability of electric service, provide recommendations to address the barriers through the methods uh, identify, evaluate electric market structure and pricing, and, and so what does all of that mean? It means everything is on the table. Um, and, and it's a uh, pretty solid look, as uh, Chairman Patty would say, it's a big look under the hood uh, for the ERCOT market to see what makes sense. The other bill that's in this group is Senate Bill 713, Sunset Review. The Sunset Review process is a legislative process to review state agencies generally about every 12 years. Uh, to look at how the agency operates, are there changes that need to be made? It's not supposed to be a policy uh, debate. Uh, it's really supposed to be more functions of the agency. These bills often turn into significant policy debates though, when they get into the session. Um, the commission had been scheduled for sunset review in the 2025 session. That has been moved up to 2023. So. All of these, this, all of this is going to be a significant amount of work by the commission over the next two years. <clears throat> Excuse me. Shifting gears, there were there was a lot of costs associated with Winter Storm Yuri um, in the in the electric industry, and uh, obviously by customers as well. And so, what the what the legislature has uh, passed there are a number of bills that essentially able enable the refinancing of these costs. Um, so that the cost can be uh, recovered over time uh, rather than having to be paid um, up front. In many ways, as I was listening to Dub talking about PACE financing, I'm like, it's securitization, um, you know, in the, in the context of what we're talking about here. The, um, so there were four securitization bills uh, that the legislature passed. One is House Bill 1520 that is focused on providing relief to uh, retail customers with high natural gas bills. And it'll enable the retail electric utilities to securitize some of those costs in order to be able to provide immediate cost relief to retail customers and finance those costs over time. House Bill 1510 looks at non ERCOT utilities and allowing them to securitize costs associated with winter storm URI um, and recover those over time, similar to what uh, has been allowed previously following hurricanes. And then House Bill 4492 and 1580 kind of, uh, I look at as working together uh, from a securitization perspective. Um, Senate Bill 1580 is focused on electric cooperatives. And, and I'll start with that one first we kinda, because it really sets the stage for 4492 in many ways. Uh, this allows electric uh, cooperatives to use securitization to finance the extraordinary costs from, uh, from the winter storm URI from February 12th through the 20th. Um, in the case of um, electric cooperatives that owe money to ERCOT, they are required to use securitization in order to pay uh, ERCOT the money that is owed. Uh, right now, we've got Brazos Electric that owes ERCOT about $1.9 billion, uh, and Brazos Electric is in uh, the bankruptcy court right now. And then there is Rayburn Electric that is, owes ERCOT about $640 million. So between those two combined, you're looking at $2.54 billion uh, that, that is owed to ERCOT. And the total amount that is owed to ERCOT right now is 2.99 billion. So basically about $450 million. And that is actually addressed in 4492. The, the way that the securitization works on a high level is that bonds would be issued um, that would be paid for by electric cooperatives uh, over a period not to exceed 30 years. The, uh, the bonds would raise funds that could then be used by the cooperative to go on ahead and pay what it owes or cotton now. Uh, the concern, one of the concerns with regard to this bill, <clears throat> excuse me, is that the costs the, uh, that are being securitized would be borne by the Brazos electric rate payers and the Rayburn um, electric rate payers for up to the next 30 years. 
Um, so there's there's a pretty significant cost that, that could be associated with that. The House Bill 4492 um, essentially helps, <coughs> excuse me, doesn't use securitization to address the last 450 million um, that is not securitized as far as the short payments to ERCOT. Um, uh, it addresses the, that additional $450 million. The, um, and the, these are short payments that have been um, amounts that have not been paid to ERCOT by other market participants, such as retail electric providers um, and other participants in the market. What ERCOT would be able to do here is essentially borrow $800 million from the rainy day fund um, at a higher interest rate than those funds are earning today and be able to use that money to um, pay off the that $450 million securitization, as well as replenish the uh, uh, congestion revenue right revenue uh, that ERCOT had essentially borrowed from itself um, to the tune of $800 million to cover initial um, short payments. So if you do the math, you can see that we've got about 1.25 billion in between those two pots of money, the ability to up, to borrow 800 million. So I'm not sure where the math is sitting right now if that full $800 million of CRR revenue is still outstanding, but there's a potential for there to be a um, uh, not enough money to cover the amount of uh, that would need to be securitized and fully pay or cut off in real time right now. Uh, one of the questions that comes up is, why do we need to do this? What happens if we don't? Well, right now with 3.9 or with about 2.9 billion dollar or three, just 2.99 billion that is currently um, owed to ERCOT that ERCOT owes to generators that provide energy during the uh, winter storm URI, it would take about a hundred years to be able to recover that under current ERCOT processes. Um, so that would be a hundred billion dollars or hundred years to collect the revenue that is owed at a rate of 2.5 million dollars per month. And for the companies that ERCOT owes money to, they would have to wait for a hundred years to fully get paid. So the securitization kind of helps clear the decks, get people paid who are owed money and then be able to, to recover that debt um, over a period shorter than a hundred years. In addition to the ERCOT short payments uh, being part of the securitization of 4492, the, this bill also has another securitization component to it um, that is uh, has direct impacts with regard to retail customers. So there was a, a lot of discussion with regard to how long ERCOT continued to charge wholesale rate and wholesale energy at $9,000 per megawatt hour. Uh, after it had stopped load shed um, during winter storm URI. And there was uh, discussion also with regard to how could the cost of ancillary services be above $9,000, the price cap, and go upwards of $20,000 per megawatt hour. So the second component of the securitization actually would allow um, ERCOT to securitize the cost of ancillary services over $9,000 per megawatt hour, bring it down to that price cap and be able to um, securitize the impact of what's called the reliability price deployment adder. That is an adder that ERCOT used to take the wholesale price up to $9,000 per megawatt hour. The securitization is not limited to the last 32 hours of winter storm URI event, it actually covers the full period of February 12th through the 20th. The, um, the bonds that would be issued in order to uh, cover all of those costs would be recovered from loads, uh, from customer load serving entities, from customers on a load ratio share basis of over the next 30 years um, and would be translated to a uh, essentially an additional cost per kilowatt hour of consumption. The, the, this repayment also would be assessed against new market participants, not just those who are in the market at the time, which is the normal process for uh, recovering these costs from the market. What is interesting in this, uh, in this uh, process is that there is an opt out that is allowed for municipal electric utilities, electric cooperatives, river authorities, transmission level customers and Walmart so that they uh, 
if they pay all of their invoices in full for service from February 12th through 20th, go ahead and pay it all now, then they can opt out of uh, being subject to the securitization cost recovery charges uh, in the future. Uh, this is a process that the commission will set up um, following as part of the implementation of this bill. Um, for businesses that are direct, uh, residential customers and businesses directly impacted by these high costs, the um, load serving entities are required to flow through the uh, offsets that they receive from these charges to those customers. So uh, if the customer has already been billed and paid for those charges, then that customer is owed a refund. If the customer has been charged or is about to be charged for those costs, those costs have to be removed from the bill and not billed to that customer. Um, there's clearly going to be some work that needs to be sorted out for what to do with regard to, um, you know, especially the retail electric providers that have gone uh, bankrupt. So that'll be something to, to watch there. The, uh, as one might expect, there's a fair amount of litigation that is already on the books right now with regard to Winterstorm Yuri for load serving entities that receive pro proceeds from such litigation and receive proceeds from the securitization, they are required to take the proceeds that they receive from litigation, repay ERCOT so that there's no uh, double recovery there. The governor signed this bill and it went into effect on uh, June 16th. So the process for, for moving forward on that has started. Senate Bill 1580 has not yet been signed. Um, uh, Brazos Electric has asked the governor to, to veto the bill, and uh, he has up until June 20th to either sign or veto this legislation. Turning now to uh, transmission and distribution and retail side of the market, uh, Senate Bill 1281 is a bill that will make some modifications to how ERCOT looks at both reliability, new lines needed for reliability services, uh, new lines that are not needed for reliability purposes, but to see whether they're, they make sense from an economic perspective. There'll be modification with regard to the test that uh, is done on that. Um, ERCOT will be looking at um, uh, doing a biannual assessment of the grid's reliability in extreme weather scenarios and making recommendations with regard to new transmission lines there. And then finally, there is a provision that makes it easier for uh, transmission utilities to make short extensions to either serve um, uh, load serving stuff uh, to serve commercial or transmission level customers um, or, <coughs> excuse me, um, new uh, generation resources that are just a little bit away from the uh, transmission grid. The uh, House Bill 2483 is an interesting bill that uh, there primarily was discussed from the perspective of batteries, but actually is broader than just batteries. But it allows a distribution utility to lease equipment to help it restore power on the distribution grid for customers after a widespread power outage. So for example, when there is an outage and in a hospital, has lost power and it's about to run out of its backup power, the distribution utility with these kinds of assets would be able to um, help that hospital be able to regain power um, even before the, uh, the, trans the distribution grid is brought back up as a whole. Um, these resources are required to not be interconnected with the grid. They cannot sell electric energy or ancillary services to the market. And this will be something that um, utilities will have to procure on a competitive basis. On the retail side, um, the legislature, in response to a number of news articles with regard to gritty and high uh, electric bills that gritty customers uh, received as a result of Winter Storm Uri, the legislature has prohibited the um, sale of wholesale index rate plans to residential and small commercial customers. Larger customers are still able to receive these um, kinds of products, but they've got to sign an acknowledgement that was dictated by the legislature. 
Uh, in addition, the, the commission or the legislature has required that for um, fixed price products that are four months or longer, there have to be at least three notifications, uh, written notices with regard to the termination or the expiration of the contract that has to be provided in the last third of the, uh, the contract period. And so, um, uh, you know, if you have a four month product, you're looking at trying to put, provide three notices in a little over a month and a half. Uh, although your last notice has to be done 15 days before the end of the um, of the contract, if the contract will expire is less than four months, or 30 days uh, if the contract is four months or more, the um, notify notification by text or phone does not count. Um, the rep is required to provide notice to customers about a renewal offer available to the customer with the final notice to provide that offer, or the, the pricing of that. If a customer does not switch from a retail electric provider or does not sign up for a new product, then they will automatically be enrolled in this new renewal product. Um, and then that will just continue on a month to month basis. If a retail elect electric provider fails to provide proper notice of the expiration of a fixed price contract, then they are required to continue to serve the customer on that pr product at the same price until they provide proper notice of termination. The, um, you know, what will be unclear is like if how long that uh, original contract has to be extended to provide that notice. Because for example, if you had, let's say a five year uh, fixed price contract, um, you know, you would essentially have the last year and a half to provide the notice of termination. Does that mean that if you if there is a mistake made, will you have to extend that contract for a year and a half to provide notice? Uh, the statute is, is unclear in that regard. So that'll be something that the commission was uh, going to be working on um, and actually is planning on having a proposed rule out uh, to go to publication uh, in mid July. Turning to solar uh, uh, and distributed generation, several bills of note here. Senate Bill 760 provides requirements for decommissioning of utility scale uh, uh, solar projects at the end of their useful life. Senate Bill 1772 sets up a uh, program to be established by Texas A&M AgriLife Extension um, that it would be a voluntary program to uh, encourage the establishment and conservation of habitats for bees, birds, and other pollinates, pollinators in or near solar energy sites. Uh, this one has uh, already gotten some attention within the, the solar uh, industry uh, at large, and it's going to be interesting to see how this moves forward. The, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the governor has not yet signed this bill, but if it goes into effect, it will be optional for the AgriLife Extension to develop this program because the legislature did not uh, give them any money to, to develop it. And then it would be uh, participation in the program would be voluntary uh, as well. On the uh, smaller uh, scale the, of, of uh, distributed generation and solar, uh, Senate Bill 398 is a solar customer protection bill that requires residential and small commercial customers to receive key disclosures associated with the purchase lease and entering into a PPA of behind the meter uh, generation. And it also limits the extent to which a municipality can prohibit or restrict the installation of solar generators generation. Um, th on this bill, there was another bill that got added as a uh, piece of baggage at the very end, which is a bill that HEB was supporting to allow um, backup generation for uh, grocery stores in areas what we call the non-opt-in entities or NOE is the acronym that Doug gave us at the front end. Uh, this would be municipal electric utilities and electric cooperatives. What, uh, what ha during winter storm URI in areas where HEB had their backup generation up and running, they generally were able to keep the stores open for business for customers, keep the fuel pumps running. In areas uh, that like a municipality or electric cooperative 
where they have not been allowed to um, work with uh, Enchanted Rock as a company they do a lot of work with, where they had not been able to install this backup generation. Those, store, those stores went dark when the power was cut off. So there was one store here in Austin that on 183 that when the electricity got cut off, the store manager basically told everybody, take the groceries that's in your cart, go on ahead and take them. We're not going to worry about it. We can't check you out. Um, and uh, then they weren't able to you know, continue to serve the community. So this has got a lot of restrictions around it, but hopefully will Im improve their ability to operate in the future. Senate Bill 1029, um, there is a clarification on a property tax issue where there is an existing tax exemption for rooftop solar to where they, uh, the owner of a house um, uh, with rooftop solar does not have to pay additional property tax associated with the value of that installation. The argument has been made uh, that this does not apply when the rooftop solar is subject to a lease or a purchase power agreement. Senate Bill 1029 makes it clear that it doesn't matter the financing that is used, that the tax uh, exemption will apply. And then finally, with regard to distributed generation in general, I just spoke about the uh, House Bill 3916. Um, and uh, House Bill 1572 is a bill that's really focused on the oil and gas industry and allowing generators on site for <clears throat> excuse me, for at, like on a new site where they're drilling a well to be able to use, uh, uh, have a third party bring in a generation facility to provide electricity. Uh, previously, the only way that those arrangements could be structured was for the oil and gas driller to um, uh, lease the equipment on a flat rate basis. And uh, what this bill was for is to allow those transactions to, to be done on a, a kilowatt hour basis rather than a flat or free arrangement. Uh, this only it will work for situations where there's no electric service that is on site from the local electric utility. The electricity is being used on site um, only and that the generation is not being interconnected with the transmission or the distribution grid. Um, Touch and base real fast with regard to electric storage, EVs and foreign adversaries on the electric storage side. There was an issue that has been debated for a couple of years about the extent to which energy storage can be used on the distribution grid as an alternative to building traditional uh, distribution infrastructure. Uh, Senate Bill 415 uh, allows the use of up to 100 megawatts in the ERCOT region for this purpose. Um, and it will require that the utility can contract with a service from a power generation company. They still will not be able to own the batteries that are used to provide this reliability service. Uh, Senate Bill 1202 is the clarification that the uh, commission asked about um, in its scope of competition report, asking for some clarification with regard to the status of EV charging equipment and service. The bottom line here is that the legislature has now said that uh, EV charging equipment, it, the um, ownership and operation of it does not make uh, the owner or operator an electric utility and providing EV charging service is not a retail sale such that the person does not have to be, be a retail electric provider or have a retail electric provider provide that service. So this provides um, a greater opportunity for the development of EV charging equipment and service throughout the state. Finally, Senate Bill 2116 is a bill that is focused on um, ensuring that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, companies that are uh, headquartered in or majority owned or controlled by citizens of China, Iran, North Korea, Russia, or another, any other country that the governor designates, um, is those, uh, a, comp a company from those areas or controlled by citizens of those areas is not allowed to access or control critical infrastructure in Texas, uh, except as specifically allowed for product warranty and support purposes. And we've seen a number of different news stories that have been coming up with regard to concerns about potential spying. And so th this is aimed at, at shutting that down. Other legislation of note is House Bill 17 
uh, which is a, uh, essentially eliminates the ability for municipalities and other entities to um, uh, adopt uh, ordinances or requirements that uh, favor the use of electricity over natural gas. Um, it's much more convoluted than as how it gets there, but that's what that was aimed at. And then finally, um, House Bill 4242 the, uh, was the final bill standing that would have extended Chapter 313. It did not pass. And as a result, Chapter 313 will expire at the end of next year. So what's next? Uh, June 20th is the deadline for the governor to sign a veto legislation. And some key questions, is the commission going to increase from three to five commissioners? Will electric cooperatives have the ability to securitize costs from Winter Storm Uri? Will the governor veto all or part of Article 10 of the uh, budget? And Article 10 is what funds the legislature and he has threatened to veto uh, that article in retaliation for um, the failure of a voting rights uh, legislation uh, to pass at the end of last session. Um, what will the new ERCOT board look like as we uh, you know, get move from a stakeholder um, board to one that is uh, totally independent? And uh, one question that has been on my mind and I feel certain is on a lot of folks up the commission is how many rulemakings can the PUC complete while going through sunset review and the ERCOT market receives a look under the hood? it's going to be a very busy period of time. Uh, with that, I, I will uh, wrap up and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, this picture over on the left of your screen, I think is a great in, um, uh, example of distributed solar that not only can help run remote uh, field equipment, but is great as uh, shade for a cow at well. It serves multiple purposes. Be happy to answer any questions. Michael, thank you. You uh, ended us right on time in light of our uh, delayed uh, start because of, of uh, non-electricity technical issues, but uh, IT-related technical issues. Uh, if folks do have questions, please type them into the Q&A, and I'll keep an eye on that. Also, uh, you can, uh, if things come up later after we after we adjourn today, you can always uh, send those. I did have one question, Michael, and while you were talking, I was trying to do some quick research and didn't didn't come to a conclusion. You you may or may not know this, but on the uh, the uh, solar exemption bill, uh, you mentioned residential, uh, and and my question is, do you know if that applies to commercial as well? Uh, in the tax code, okay, it says a person, and it, and I'm assuming that means a it could be a business owner as well as so commercial as well as residential. Yeah, that is my recollection is that it does apply both to uh, to residential and commercial. Okay, okay. Yeah, obviously in the PACE context, that can be important as 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 business owners, commercial business owners are looking at, at utilizing PACE for solar installations and, and that uh, that tax exemption benefit is certainly part of their calculation. Absolutely. Okay. Looking here, uh, I don't see any open questions. Uh, you answered them all or... It's uh, so uh, it's it's uh, enough new jargon and acronyms that people are still absorbing and digesting <laughs> that, which is entirely possible. I'm about fifty percent fluent in in these uh, uh, jargon in the jargon electricity world jargon and acronyms. I know uh, Michael is an expert, but uh, when it, when it's uh, tossed at you uh, all at once, it can be a, it can be a little much. Uh, yeah, and unfortunately, there's just a lot to go through from from what happened this session. It's you know, I've read some articles and they said, oh, well, you know, the legislature made just some uh, small changes to the market. And I think it's important to recognize that, frankly, there's a lot of changes that got made and there's right. a lot more that could be coming. Yeah. Uh, we do have a couple of questions now that popped up. Uh, first one, uh, Michael, any uh, any special sessions uh, expected? And, and I guess maybe the implied question there is, is will energy and, and, and related issues, follow on issues uh, be addressed as, as part of any special session? So um, I think the expectation at this point is uh, we, that there's going to at least be a special session this fall that deals with redistricting issues. There's uh, been an increasing talk with regard to a potential special session in July, uh, especially if the governor uh, vetoes all or part of Article 10. Um, 
and so we'll, it remains to be seen there. My 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 hunch is is that we're not likely to see um, electric issues come up in the special session, primarily because there is so much that has been done that you know to really see the results of that is going to depend on uh, implementation of what just got done during the session, but. Not, not to say that people are not going to be asking for, you know, some issues that they wanted to, to have addressed or, or some bills that they wanted to see pass that didn't pass. They very well may, um, you know, see about getting those on the, on the call. Right. And another question here. I'm not sure I understand the question. I do. My, okay. Gotcha. okay. <laughs> so the question is uh, whether real-time co-optimization is going to okay. solve everything. Okay. And, and I don't think that, you know, real-time co-optimization itself does not solve everything, but what it does do is it provides the opportunity um, for, uh, to really get more real-time uh, participation in the ancillary services market. Um, it will solve the issue with regard to the high ancillary services costs because that will be uh, brought together um, with the real-time market you know, it, it, in a way that it is not today. We've got a differentiation there. Okay. And one more I see, do you see this question, Michael, yes. PDSBs? Yeah. Do you wanna yes, they are allowed to, uh, my recollection, they will be allowed to, oper to um, include it in their cost recovery. And I believe they're also allowed to uh, earn a uh, return on that. Okay. Very good. Well, uh, good presentation. Appreciate it, Michael. Uh, I know this is uh, the second time you've done it today uh, and uh, slightly different audiences, but uh, uh, getting getting the word out, as you said, uh, a few things happened uh, during the session. It uh, certainly did not start off uh, seeming like it was going to be an energy or an electricity session, but uh, the, the, the week following Valentine's Day uh, changed everything. In a major uh, way. So uh, we appreciate your attendance today. Uh, you look for an email from us uh, later uh, with a link uh, to this, as well as a survey and a PDH hour certificate for attending. And hopefully uh, you've learned something and we'll dig a little bit deeper into these issues. And uh, so, uh, thanks for spending an hour with us this afternoon. And again, Michael, thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thank you, Deb. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.